Pardon me? Uh, why did you join the service? I didn't. I was drafted. Um, how old were you when you went to I church? was uh, 20 years old. 20 years old? Yeah. When I went, I was, I raised when I was 18 and I went into 20. Mm -hmm. um, how old were you when you were discharged? Uh, I was 23. What was your family's reaction to you going into the service? What was your family's reaction to you going into oh. the service? It was all right. It wasn't bad. They was uh, a little concerned, but they didn't reject anything. Um, did you have any siblings that also served? I had uh, a twin brother, and the two of us went in service together. Mm -hmm. um, how were you able to communicate? Well, by uh, mail. Um, were you married when you went into the service? Single. Were you, uh, where were you stationed during the war? I went to Fort Benning for my basic training. I left Fort Benning and went to Fort McCullough and uh, finished complete my basic training. I stayed there a while and then I went down to uh, Louisiana to, can't think of the camp there, and stayed there for uh, six weeks. Then I went to Fort Ord, California. I stayed there for six more weeks. And on the September the 9th, 1936, I sailed from, from Los Angeles, Fort Los Angeles, to the Philippine Islands. Uh, what was your rank? I went in as a private, and uh, after being in for uh, six, seven months, I was, well, no longer than that, maybe, I was made a technical sergeant to go overseas. After my basic training in Fort Ord, I went overseas. There was only uh, four of us, five of us in the whole, in, in the company going overseas, I think that had a high school education. Although it was an integrated ship, we were separated, we were not together. And uh, after getting overseas, I was made a tech corporal. I stayed a tech corporal for three months, then I was promoted to sergeant. And that again was because of the educational status of the company. The uh, company's first sergeant had a third grade education. They sent the guys up from Guam to join us in the uh, Philippine Islands, and uh, their education status was that of a third grade student. And uh, there was only four or five of us in the company who had completed our high school work. What were your duties during the war? Well, after basic training, I got overseas. I was tech five, and uh, I was a mail clerk for four or five months. Then after that, they needed uh, some sergeants for patrol duty. So after about four or five months, I was promoted to sergeant, and I remained that until I came out in 46. What kind of environment did you work in? Well, it was pretty nice, uh, as I said before. We were, wasn't integrated. We was in an all-black unit even through basic and all. Uh, when we went overseas, we was uh, on a Dutch freighter, and uh, it wasn't uh, the most uh, pleasant place to be because of uh, the Dutch cooking and their diet is garlic. And uh, we was in the Pacific during the time of the Okinawa storm, and uh, we had rough days, rough, rough days, for many days we couldn't go up on deck. But my job on the ship was to help to make sure that all the garbage was thrown overboard. And uh, I did that. Overseas, I, after I got overseas, I was put into a quartermaster company. I'd never driven a truck before. And uh, I drove a truck for about a month, and then they promoted me to patrol sergeant. 
They would make me a sergeant, and then I had a driver. I patrolled the area. At that time, the Japanese, I uh, love Japanese, Chinese and Filipinos, were stealing. And not only that, soldiers were selling. They get a whole load of sugar. They might sell it. Uh, they pretend that this took it from them. Clothes and also we had to have, had we had to guard the trucks. We had to patrol the trucks to make sure they got to their base, uh, cut where they're supposed to be with the goods. So I was there for maybe nine months or more, or ten months, and after that, uh, I was I came home. I had just two years old. The, uh, a year was yeah, two years old. See. What was your unit's responsibilities? Well, as I say, when I got overseas, it was, I was, it was in a trucking company. We was hauling goods, uh, the cargo that came in off the ship. We had to, it was loaded on the trucks, it was brought into the various army camps, bases. And those that weren't stolen, those that weren't sold, they got to the right place. We had our, a lieutenant who sold a whole ship at sea. It was out in the bay, and uh, he sold the whole ship and, uh, to uh, some Chinese, uh, uh, Philippines, somebody. He was a lieutenant uh, at that time. How, do you, uh, how did you like your commanding officer? Well, fine, no problem. I, uh, I say, only very basic that I have a commanding officer. After basic, I was on the, I was in control. Units, I was mail clerk. If the mail clerk, I went to start. I stayed that position for a year or two. Did you make a lot of friends during the war? Quite a few. That did. Our, that was sir. Uh, quite. A, well, and being a mail clerk, I had a chance to intermingle with a lot of people because we had uh, guys could, who, who could even read their own mail. No, we had to. I had to read the mail to them. I had to write letters for them. So I had a lot of friends. So my closer friends was there. Uh, one guy out of a lot of you, Texas, in Kimberley, and another was out of Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, what was his name? Gosh, I can't think of his name. Then there was a Bonero out of Louisiana. He was a high school graduate. And uh, my twin brother and I stayed together all through service. We were together, so he was there. And we got rank promotion at the same time. So friendship was good. Did you lose any friends in the war? No. The war was over. When I got there, uh, I had some friends who were killed later in the war. I had some students. I had a student of mine who was killed by Helen. I had a good friend of mine, uh, Hogan's, uh, was killed in the war. And uh, I I had a chance to go to his field and all. He was he was from Henry County. Uh, I had a couple of guys close to that I got killed. Mm. How were you able to communicate with friends and family back home? Through mail. Did you get to read while you were in the service? What? Did you get to read while you were in the service? Yes, I did. I uh, <coughs> I did something unusual. I went to uh, and if I was in the Philippine Island, I uh, went to the university. Manila and the Philippines and took her uh, French. I had a chance to go and I, I did read uh, at Madrina. Um, how did you get the news? Uh, by mail. They sent me a card that I was to report for military duty and I did Fort Bennett, Georgia. Mm. Did you ever feel lonely? Well, er, uh, maybe not, because, sir, uh, I had my brother with me. My brother was there, we shared books. His book was here, and mine was here. Then when we got over, going overseas, I was down here, his book was here. And then we had double books, occasionally while we were there for a while. So I had to, uh, someone always could communicate with. And we stayed together all the time. We stayed together. 25 years, and uh, never was separated two weeks. Did you ever feel a need to clear a leaf? No. How did you feel about your enemies? 
Well, I didn't there have that many to be encountered with there because Beaners were not enemies to us, they were friends to us. Uh, there was a few Japanese who was hungry and they came out of the mountains into the mess hall and I didn't have to worry about them because the Filipinos knew them. And if they came to the mess hall, they had a fit and we knew something was wrong. So they did that. Dun, 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 dun. They different languages. Rolling Island, where I was, they spoke several different languages. There was some could speak English and some couldn't. So what they did there, uh, they let us know they were there. And there was, we had patrol, uh, MPs who would come and get them. I can't remember, but they would come into the mess hall and eat. And the Filipinos would know it. Our show. I didn't, I didn't really have it done. Filipinos were nice to us. They were the nice people. Uh, it was kind of bad there because they, uh, a lot of us hungry, had no food, and uh, they would uh, do most anything for a bar of candy or a cup of rice and anything like that, which was kind of sad. What was the most exciting moment that you experienced? Quite a few. <laughs> oh, I had a chance to uh, go up in the mountains while I was there for 11 days to stay, and that was kind of exciting. Um, Philippine Islands in the mountains. I was up there for 11 days, and uh, that was uh, kind of uh, a retreat for us. Another exciting day was going to wish to see on ship and uh, the rough waters. Because some nights we had to hold to stay in the bed. The water was so rough. And I've seen there a lot of guys who would go to eat and they forget to hold the tray and the whole thing would just go bang. We had a couple of guys. We had one guy, I think, died. He uh, got seasick. He didn't eat a single day after we left port for 22 days. And uh, I'm told, uh, we don't know what happened to him, that he died. He was just had that meat for just 22 days, and he was just out there just getting involved, so to speak. What was the most fearful moment that you experienced? I really don't recall having one. Well, this was too scary. Uh, the things was we were really supposed to have joined the 97th Division in Tokyo, and they changed our orders in the middle of the Pacific. And sent us to the Philippine Island. So there was really no terrible things or moments that I had to encounter because uh, everything was nice and calm. Yeah. What was the most heroic act that you observed? Oh, I, I think one of the most heroic things was the independence day for the Philippine Islands, where we took our part in the uh, in the parade. And uh, I think this I read to what you said. Uh, that was MacArthur was in charge, and uh, we had to parade that day for the Philippine Islands to get their uh, freedom. I had no bad experiences. Well, maybe at basic, we had a first sergeant. Uh, whatever you put on your plate, you had to eat it, and that was kind of uh, bad. And. Uh, the food wasn't uh, bad, but sometimes you got some things you didn't want going through the line, and uh, that was pretty different because he hollered as well. I didn't ever have to uh, go on any extra KP duty. I have had KP, but I didn't have to go because of any discipline effects. How did your faith help you throughout your military career? Well, I had strong family ties. My mother, my mother and father were teachers, and I had brought, been brought up in that type of environment. And we had developed; they had developed with us, for us, strong religious beliefs and strong religious ties. So I had no problems as far as trying to make adjustments at all. I had been exposed to a lot of things that many of the other things that many of the other soldiers had not been exposed to because of my mother and father being in the uh, profession that they were in. How do you feel today about your service to your country? Very proud. 
How were you treated when you came home from the war? Well, things wasn't as good. I, I've had some feelings about that because I, I felt that uh, I had done a terrific job. I had served my country with honor and dignity. And when I came home, I had to come back and face the segregation of problems of discrimination. And I, I, I thought that was bad. And I think it's still bad today that if those of us who have served, uh, I, I think we should have been given more recognition than we was given. Even overseas in the Philippine Islands, the uh, white soldiers in the company had told the uh, Filipinos that we had tails, and we was all this and we were that. They told them many derogatory things about black soldiers, and uh, we had to deal with that. I came home, I went back to college, and in the meantime, I went to vote. At that time, I couldn't vote. I had to uh, give uh, explanations from the, the uh, Constitution. I had to quote certain articles from the Constitution to be able to vote. I was restricted from going into uh, various places to do things. I I have been a target of discrimination. I, I remember I stopped once in uh, Louisiana. I've been I've been traveling. I used to travel quite a bit to California. All the people were there, and in traveling to California, we had to, uh, one place we could stop after we left uh, Alabama. That was in there. Uh, Streetport, Louisiana, we had a little place we could stop and eat, and the next place was Texas. And then, we, after we left Dallas, Fort Worth, the next place, place we had was uh, El Paso. And uh, it was nice there. I recall going out once, I had a little accent for some reason, I don't know why. We stopped in, I stopped out of uh, Mexico, okay, but then the place was down. And I called in for a room, and uh, they told me, yes, we have plenty of rooms. I was only less than 50 miles out. And when I got to the place, it was about 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, when I pulled up, you know, where the place is, oh, no, we don't, we have of rooms. We sold out. I said, well, I just called you less than 30, 40 minutes ago, and you said plenty of rooms. Yes, but we don't have any more now. So I had to keep driving. I had to drive on to California, having nowhere to stay. And it's, that's, that's not who I was, it did. Uh, I was traveling also once. I was in uh, Louisiana, and I, I needed some coffee. I had been traveling all night, and there was no place to stop. And uh, I went to get some coffee, and the gentleman said, well, we don't serve, you know, what the cost. And, and this nigga's in this place. I said, well, I'm sorry, this, I didn't come after nigger coffee. I came after black coffee. He said, well, we'll serve some this time. But you have to go around to the back. I said, no, I'm not going to the back. If you can't serve me here, I won't drink no coffee. He said, well, come on, I'm going to serve you this time. I said, well, there won't be another time. I won't stop no more. She won't have to worry about that. I need some coffee. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I've been driving now since way early night. I was coming to California home. So he saw me some coffee. and uh, But I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter about any things that has happened over the past years as far as being discriminated against at all. I, I think it was a mixing of people not understanding and accepting. And I have been very fortunate. I came here work with you and people in the school system, and it has been a pleasure. You have been nice people to work with. I, I think Hendon is a nice place. I have been well accepted here by the whites. And they have been very nice to me, and I'm very appreciative of it. So, I'm not bitter. I'm really, I'm, I'm blessed and thankful that I have been able to survive this. I had, I had some experiences here, and uh, I, maybe I shouldn't tell you all this. <laughs> I, uh, I first came here, I, I didn't go into the stores because everywhere I went, everybody stopped and stared at me, and they, of time would make the remark, where is that Yankee from? So I went to the drugstore here and one other store. And uh, all the reason I went to the drugstore because the lady I was living with worked with the people at the drugstore. 
I went back to Montgomery and bought my clothes. I went in one store in Delta, that was uh, Bloomberg's, because they had no, well, they don't, they act, but that's when I went in to buy things. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I stopped down the highway here to get some gas, and uh, when I got in to pay for the gas and turn around and walk out, some gentleman says, well, where's that damn Yankee from? Oh, uh, so I didn't say anything. I, I'm used to this. I just kept walking and didn't say anything. So things have not been well, but they're not bad. So as I say, Helen has been nice to me. People, whites and as well as blacks have been nice to me. I've had no problems. I came into the school system with integration, and I had no problems. I had two students used to worry in my presence, and they apologized to me. I told them, don't worry about anything. I had them to relax and know that that was not an offensive thing that I would fly with them about, and they in turn accepted it, and we had a good relationship. That's good. Uh, do you have any other experiences that you would like to tell us about? <laughs> Gosh. I'm an avid traveler. I, I love to travel. I have gone into all of the states except eight. I have gone overseas. I've been to several foreign countries. I have gone... Where else? I know where else. I've been to England. I've been to Rome, I've been to France, I've been to Germany, I've been to Hawaii, I've been to Mexico, I've been to Canada. Welcome. I hope to go this summer. Uh, yeah. Next next year. I hope to go to Alaska. And then I have only a few of the states up in the east that I need to go to. I've been to all the western states. Uh, one of my dreams when I was growing up was to travel. I, I grew up in a rural. I worked on the farm. Uh, we had a farm. The only thing I could do, I couldn't stay out of school. I had to go to school. My mother and father were teaching, so we had to go to school. We had cows. We hired hogs. We had chickens. We had horses and mules. I had to make sure those things were spared and was taken care of in the afternoons when I got home out of school. And after school, I had to work. If there was any work to be done on the farm for night, or during the summer, on Saturdays, I know then school time, I had to work on Saturday. We didn't have no time off. We had to work because we had to go to school. So I have fond memories of my relationship with people. Uh, and I, as I say, I travel a lot. I met a lot of people. I know a lot of people because of my travel. Uh, I took my kids. I have two children. My son's a doctor, my daughter's a pharmacist. I decided some years ago that one of the best things for them would be for me to spend some time with them. I'm a workaholic. I work all the time. I told my wife, every two weeks out of the year, I'm going to take off, we're going to travel. So we did. We went somewhere, we left, and we took, we was gone 30 days. We went down across into Mexico, old Mexico, came over back across up through California into Nevada, across to Kansas City back around down to Birmingham, we was gone a month. My wife and I took a train trip, we was gone for a month. And we, so we, we've done a lot, and we've traveled a lot. I have enjoyed life, I have a good family, and uh, we enjoy life together. I have had, I've enjoyed my teaching career, I have enjoyed students, I enjoy young people. I spent a lot of time with them, and all. Some of the most rewarding things that have happened has been my relationship with when I came here 53 years ago now. There had not been a black boy to college, and uh, I was told by my co workers that no one would ever go. I says, Don't tell me what has never happened, just tell me what you haven't had to happen. So I got that done. I got some young people who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are preachers everything. I got them. I carried them myself. I carried some kids out of here who had never been to Dublin. I carried them across the state uh, to like Decatur and Alicefield, way across Tuskegee and all those places. I exposed them and that's been one of the greatest rewards I've had knowing that I've done something to help somebody else. And it's 
It's cost me a lot of money, but it's good. I was a Boy Scout 25 years. I ran the scouting, and uh, it was good. I had a troop as large as 60, some boys, and uh, I was able to control them. One of the scariest things I had, maybe, I was out camping with the Boy Scouts, and one of my boys almost got drowned in. I, I was way up on the hill, and uh, they hollered and scouted. He's about to drown, and, and I was sitting up there looking at them and so I saw it and uh, some way somehow by the time I got to the water I had my pants off had nothing on the way I went in and got him uh, not an average sperm but I got it to him and I just got him and held him and he wanted to fight but I just pushed him off and I brought him out that, that was a scary moment for me because I almost left him by the sun draw and I could have never gotten over it but everything worked good we had a good time. I've, had, I've enjoyed having it. I, the only thing that I, maybe I should have done that didn't do, I had opportunities to leave Helen, and I reckon, and I'm supposing that I was destined to stay here. I passed a civil service job for uh, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, um, Houston, Texas. I passed a civil service job for that, I turned it down. I have a California credential to go teach in California, and my people were there. I turned that down. And my aunt was on the board of hiring Brian Teachers in Detroit. I turned that down. And because of my relationship with the school and doing for students, I could have gone to any school most in Alabama. At that time, it was all black. I was offered jobs, many jobs, and I turned them down to stay in heaven, I don't regret it. I don't. I uh, might have been better off financially if I had gone, but I have no, no food. Yeah, but I just love food. But it's been nice. And uh, you, you young people have been nice. I don't. I haven't had, in my 37 years of teaching, I've never really had to send a single student to the principal's office. I've never had a student that I could not control. All I have to do is speak, and all I had to do was speak, and that was it. And that was my, that was all students' way. I don't, I, I, I don't like, I don't like the idea of saying why you black students. I say students. They're all students, and, and I treated them like that, and because of that, and 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 the people I work at the office now. Of it, I uh, and my two ladies who work with me are, they are amazed. They say, Well, Mr. Carter, what did you do? Everybody comes by, everybody's glad to see you. And I say, Well, I don't know. The only thing I did, I treated all my life. I don't care who it was, who son it was. In my world, there was somebody. I treated them like that. And because of that, then, I get the respect that I was supposed to have from them. Is there any other experiences you'd like to say? Oh gosh, don't let me tell no more. <laughs> <laughs> I got me off. Don't let me tell no more. Uh, I did have a student that uh, I, I tell this I'd be going. Uh, I want to go to church too. Uh, I had this young man who I could not read his test papers. He was a DF student. He came every day where I was and talked to me. And the only thing he ever talked about was going to school. I would call him to the desk and I would read his paper, read the answer off, and tell him to tell me what it meant. And that's why I read his paper. He was voted to be one of the students that would never succeed or do anything. He went to college. I got him in college. I don't know how it was done. A DF student. I got him in college. He went through college. He worked his way through. He finished college. He worked one year. And he came back again and asked me if he could go to grad school. And I asked him, did he need to rest? He says, no, I need to go to school. He went to college, got his master's. He came back to work two years. He came back again and asked me, can, he, can I go to work on my PhD? I says, son, I said, I think you ought to take a rest. Why don't you take a rest? He said, 
No, he said, I, he said, I got a fellowship. He said, I want to go. So I went. Everything he'd done, before he would do it, he came to me. And he was the first black boy from the school system, who, and a, Helen here, who got a PhD in political science. So when you tell me what a child can't do, don't worry about that. Just tell me, let me give him a chance. And he would do it. This boy did. He, yeah. he, he, he was, it was unbelievable that he would do this. And he did. And he's quite proud of it now. He's up at the University of uh, Tennessee, he's University Tennessee State in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. He's heading into political science there now. But he was a DF student. And the only C he got it was probably the one I gave him in the whole year. Full time in school. But he went through. Thank you, fellas. Well, thank you, Mr. Cutler, for coming.